Business Brain, the show for entrepreneurs, episode 426 for Wednesday, February 22nd, 2023. Greetings, folks, and welcome back to Business Brain. We are the show where we take all aspects of our lives and filter them through our business brains to try and get the most value and the most efficiency out of everything. Because whether it's our actual business lives, our hobbies, our personal lives, there's always benefits to using our business brains. Here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. And still out in California, I'm Shannon Jean. I'm excited about our show today. We've got a, a great interview. We hadn't done one in a while. And uh, this is just the type of business owner that I love talking with. Um, Super authentic, and I think there's going to be some great lessons uh, today. I agree. Yeah, it's it's Mani Bouchon from Taco Ocho, which is a small chain of restaurants that he created. Uh, it remains privately owned. It's his in the Dallas Fort Worth area, or maybe the Dallas area. I don't know. I don't know. I, I didn't look at it on a map to see if it spreads that far out. It doesn't really matter. He's got a lot of lessons to share. Lately, you know, we've been doing uh, two episodes a week, much shorter episodes, the 15-ish, 15 to maybe 20-minute episodes. This week, we are breaking that form. Uh, this interview, the meat of the interview ran, you know, almost 30 minutes. And we thought, okay, we can chop this up into two pieces and deliver, you know, one to you today and one to you on Friday. Or we can just give you the whole thing and you can choose when to ha hit pause and when to hit resume. Now. I know we all understand that intellectually and applying our business brains to this. That seems to make sense to me. However, if you folks would have rather that we chop this up, let us know for the future feedback at businessbrain.show. We're happy to, to you know, we want to we want to deliver things in the way that you want. We've heard great feedback about the bite sized episodes. And so, um, I, I, you know, I just I I. It's one thing like this interview. So to spread it out across multiple episodes seemed counterintuitive to us. Yeah. But, no, but, there wasn't a, re a good reason to do it. So, But maybe there is. Maybe there's a reason that we don't see yet. Yes. And, and our business brain, uh, our business brainiacs out there will, will inform us. But for now, let's go listen to Monty. Monty, thank you so much for joining us today. We're really excited to learn about you and your business, Taco Ocho. Okay. And so l let's get started a little bit. I'm really fascinated by the, your uh, long history working f in rest in the restaurant industry and then the transition that you made. So tell us a bit about Taka Ocho, how you got started back in 2011 and what the company looks like now. Okay. Taka Ocho is a family owned business and uh, we serve Latin food, basically we have gathered food from different Latin American countries and actually enhanced the flavors by being creative and inventive. And we try to serve that in the neighborhoods at affordable price points so that we give people awesome food, which is healthy. We give gluten-free options, vegan options, and everything is made from scratch. So that's, uh, that's what the concept is about. Now, how did I end up there? I worked for large companies all my life. And I got fed up during the process because they were all trying to kind of assure that there is 20% growth in profit every year and we're serving more and more processed food. I said, no, I got to serve people something special, something, something they really enjoy and healthy for them. So I decided, okay, I'll leave the corporate America. It's time for me to be unbridled and move on because I was always, always a maverick and creative. I said, it's time for me to go do something different. So I took four year vacation, basically drank a lot of wine, traveled a lot, uh, cooked every day, almost to the extent my wife put me in an action plan saying, don't make any more food. You're making me fat. <laughs> so <laughs> during that process, I really created some awesome food. And then I hired a sous chef from Four Seasons in Mexico City, wanted him to take my recipes and create sauces so that we can easily cook fresh food in the restaurants. Once that was done, 
having worked for big companies, I did taste panel studies on the food by inviting 31 people to make sure what stays and what goes. And then when I was ready, I launched the first store in 2011. And was it an immediate success? No, not at all. <laughs> no. So I opened my first store in the middle of the recession. Oh, all right. Even, yeah. Even with all my experience, all the shopping centers don't want to give somebody who is brand new an opportunity to get a great location, which is different now. I can get what I want now. But so I had to settle for an empty shopping center with no one in the shopping center except me. Wow. Oh, man. So no, no anchor to bring people in no and, anchor, and walk no them anchor. past your store. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, I mean, it was a struggle. Uh, so, but we made it work. It took a lot of 80-hour weeks, but I made the concept work. But the, the, it had, the location had some inherent problems. Though it did some daytime business, it did not do much night business. And I understood soon that when you're taking so much time and effort to create really good food with so many flavors, which is almost like spending 10 hours of prep every day to create the stuff, you can't make it work in an office environment. People are still gonna consider you as a lunch play and you don't get credit for what you're doing. I see. So yeah, so subsequent to that, I started going to neighborhoods which have at least decent higher incomes and then started opening stores. And then that seemed to be the mantra. That's great. When, when did you open the second location? The second location opened in March of 2015. Okay. Yeah. And it, it looks like your third location opened not that long after that, correct? Yeah, so the third location opened in October of 2015. Wow. And that was, that was a mistake because <laughs> you know, so, so, to train people to get the consistency because our food is a little bit more complicated. There are so many different sauces go, so many things we mix together to get flavors which can't be replicated very easily so that we have a unique selling proposition. So that makes it, on the other hand, very difficult to kind of scale it. That's the reason I never even considered franchising the concept because once you franchise, you, to get the same quality and maintain it is not going to be so, so easy. Got it. So yeah. despite despite this, what I'll call your efficiency of sauces at, at the beginning, that right. that's not that's not enough to just turn this into say a you know cookie cutter scenario. No, unless I make the sauces somewhere else, and oh. then you know. But we don't. We prepare in every store. We hand dice, hand cut, cook, drill everything in the store to make sure it is fresh and awesome. So, okay, so I misunderstood when you said that that you you figured you you hired a sous chef and figured out the recipes for the sauces, but you're not you're not making no. them in a central location and delivering no. them. Ah, no, got I'm, it. Okay, right. I made the recipes, but to 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 make something like in fine dining, yeah. you make sauces and then you saute pan cook. That way, it is fresh. So I did not know how to make the sauces coming from fast food background. I knew how right. to make the recipe. He came and taught me how to make the sauces. Got it. That makes, right. okay, gotcha, gotcha. Well, I mean, a, a valuable thing, but but it still doesn't, it doesn't scale like a franchise would need to scale or something. So yeah, okay, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yep. So, so Monty, after working with big companies for, you know, so long and 30, 40 years, you, you go out on your own and was was it similar to when you were working for somebody else or were there things that surprised you about now that you were in the employer and and you were making those decisions talk about the that difference and how that mindset uh, no, had to kind of change transition is kind of you know you're prepared for it but you're not so in a big company when you run an ad to hire employees you get so many resumes in a small company nobody knows who you are hmm. and you you have trouble attracting talent. The whole thing about this business is having great food and great people. So the biggest challenge when you're small is attracting the people, especially if you don't have any family members working for you. So that was a big struggle. And then you have to do payroll yourself. You got to do marketing. You have to do pretty much everything yourself because you don't really have no GNA, no staff. 
So in, in corporate, you could pick up the phone and there are people to help you. So you got to make your own ops manual. So right. when you have a new product launch, you're the guy who goes and makes the presentation and trains people in the other stores. So it's very complicated than in a large company. But at the same time, you don't sacrifice your creativity and you don't do things you don't believe in. And you get to do, you get to make decisions which are good for the customer. And then you're so close to customers. So there's a 99% probability that whatever you do will succeed. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, this is, yeah, I, I think the, the, this is the part of the lesson that I think is super important for anyone starting a business that thinks, oh, you know, start business step one and then step two profit. You know, it, it, there's, we, we joke that overnight success takes about 20 years and, yeah. uh, and, and that, that proves out to be true more often than not. Sometimes it's 10 years. Sometimes it's five. It's yeah. rarely ever five days or even 20 days. So yeah. <laughs> Every now and then somebody gets very lucky and it happens. Sure. sure. Yeah. So, but, but even then, even in those scenarios, if you dig into it, they might have, you know, the venture you know about got lucky, but it usually doesn't come out of nothing, right? There's usually been four failures before that that taught them plenty of lessons that set them up for that, that you're right, very fortunate success, but yeah. Yeah, so the biggest challenge is you're a small business. Nobody knows about you. You need about 20 to 30,000 customers for each store to hit about a million dollar sales based on you know, ticket average and so on, the frequency of the customers, the, the, the super frequent customer, the infrequent customer, so on. When you actually look at it, it takes you that many customers. To acquire that many customers is not easy when you don't have market penetration. A, a city like Dallas-Fort Worth has 8 million people. You need about 45 stores to get market exposure. With four stores, nobody knows who you are, and it is so difficult to get traction. So that's where the biggest challenge is. Yeah, I, I, that sounds like it. And I, and I probably tougher to get economies of scale and and that, that kind of thing with, with you know fewer fewer locations, right? Right, totally. Yeah. Yeah. Have you thought about opening a store in a smaller area? B you know, a, a bigger fish, smaller pond, or same size fish, smaller pond? No, I, mean, I have tried different. Uh, like for the, the store in Frisco is a very small store. It's full service, but it's still 1,600 square feet. Got it. And then mm, it's, uh, it's doing close to a million dollars. So hey, that's not a bad experiment. Yeah. Uh, so, okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's terrific. What one of the comments you made that I that stuck with me here that I want to go back to is you said when leaving the corporate world and then going out on your own, it got you much closer to the customer. And was it? Uh, I'm I'm assuming by you know it sounds like uh, an enjoyable thing that that was something you enjoyed and and it re was rewarding for you, right? Right. So what happens in a in a big company? You want to launch a product. You have so many layers of people and everybody adds their own uh, biases to it. So I don't want to say the names, two companies yes. come to my sure. mind. Uh, one went back and invested a lot of money, changed the menu, and then got a lot of great food, healthy food for a concept which was built on serving, you know, uh, <laughs> food which is not healthy. So it was a major failure. Yeah. But all the testing and everything else said, oh, yeah, it's great. We'll want to eat that. But in reality, it never happened. So the, that concept lost a lot of, lot of business. And then they had to go back to the other side. And that's even distracted customers even more. So by being, I lost only one product, one case a year without talking to the customers. And guess what? It failed. Interesting. I'm yeah. pulling in two weeks. Oh, that's a, yeah, that's that's crazy. And okay, so your background, uh, you're national. You're from from India, born in the United States, born in India. No, I was born in India. Okay, uh, came to here pretty young, about yeah. 22 year old. I went to college uh, here. Some went to college yeah. there. Uh, so uh, started out in the restaurant. I mean, I was an account executive in India, oh, uh, okay. leading that agency. Uh, so, but. When you come to a different country, you're going to school, you're not going to do the same exact thing. It's very difficult to break in. So I said, okay, let me go to restaurants. So I started there 
and I worked my way up. So I was a national senior VP for two large companies uh, running almost as many as 1,800 units. Wow. That's yeah. awesome. So how, how did you then come into to Latin food? Was it just your you, what no, you enjoyed and you made things that you liked and you thought you share that no, with people or different? No, no. One thing is my wife is a Mexican, okay? Uh-huh. But she's a bad cook when she cooks the pots and pans run away. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, so I worked for Taco Bell. So uh-huh. I knew Mexican food. So I, I, I said to myself, but, so when I went to Mexico to ask, uh, you're, you're supposed to go ask the hand of her, uh, her, your daughter's hand. You got supposed to go and ask the parent. So I went there and they served me food, which was very different than what we eat in the U.S., what we call Mexican here. Uh-huh. So I said, wait, this makes sense. So I started exploring and learning. So I traveled a lot, took her along so she can talk in Spanish. We went to small villages, talked to people, got to see so much of what we don't see. Then we went to Peru, went to different Latin American places. And I said, I got to bring flavors we're not used to and probably enhance them. To give you an example, in uh, in Ecuador, they use the meat and they put some chilies in it and they call it carne colorado. We took that, changed, we added beer to it and slow cooked it, and then put a jicama slaw on it to give it a different flavor profile, and it's a great hit. So the, every product we got, we played with something really authentic and then kind of gave it a little twist to make it n- not easily copyable so that we have a, we have a standalone concept. I like that. Yeah, that's great. The uniqueness of it and the, the traveling around and finding uh, these, these dishes and flavors. And I think that's terrific. Um, okay. So you, you talked about staffing and I, I want to talk about, it cause that seems like, uh, oh. a constant challenge, especially right now. Cause right. You know, we even if you don't own a service business, we've all been impacted by lack of staff availability and, you know, uh, how, would, how do you deal with it? I would call it, it's a nightmare. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, even before COVID, it was difficult to staff. After COVID, it was a nightmare. I'm having to work at my age in stores all the time and not trying to do strategic important things, but to help, you know, run the food and stuff like that. So it was very, very bad for a long time. Finally, we're getting some people. It's not the same quality. Interesting. I used to get great quality 10 years ago. You know, I mean, when I first opened the store in 2011, when I put an ad outside on the window, I would get... 200 resumes. Right now, I can't even get two. Wow. I spend about $500 every two weeks on Indeed. Yeah. 15 people apply, and maybe one may show up for the interview. Wow. What, what's it's, your take on the... the I mean, I don't, even, I, 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 I don't know what is going yeah. on. With this. Um, maybe there are so many jobs available. They just get so many people call them. They take one, and they don't even have the courtesy to call you back. It's been very frustrating. Yeah, yeah, I can I can imagine. Have you tried to implement you know any kind of automation or things to 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 make no, up for lack of staff or? No, I haven't. I'm I'm looking at it automating yeah. without sacrificing. So yeah, we have done minor things, but uh, so but I didn't want so all the big companies have gone to kitchen miners. Basically, sh- lettuce is shattered somewhere. The, everything is diced somewhere. Meat is cooked. You put in a re-thermalizer, make it hot. I didn't want to do that. If the yeah. minute you do that, the whole charm of local good-for-you concept is not same. I'm lying to customers when I do that. Yep. I, I, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, that, that seems to be just such a challenging thing, a constant battle. Um, w- well, what happened? How did you... What did you do when the pandemic hit and everything got shut down? How did you adapt no, no. to that? We were, no, it, it, it's, it's funny. So I was I was reading in restaurant news and I saw Panera has 31% digital sales. Then I said, oh. marketing is moving towards digital. Why can't we grow our business in digital? Yeah. So in 2019, having worked for big companies, even though I, I was so small company, I, I actually made strat- strategic plans every year for what I got to accomplish. So the strat plan we made in 2019 was to acquire 30% in digital sales. With that, we implemented, we had we were one of the first people to go with uh, DoDash. And then we implemented uh, online ordering systems. 
and we went to easy catering and kind of approached them to kind of do the catering sales. And then we printed flyers and gave it to all the customers who came and we prepared customers ahead of time, not even knowing there's going to be a pandemic. Wow. And then awesome. March 19th, when the yeah. dining rooms got shut, except for one store in Richardson, which is only in business district, it was down 50%. But the other, other two stores, which are open at that time, had very little impact because our customers allowed our food and we made some very fast signs and created curbside signs outside. But as far as the system to go and whatever, we had all the systems in place and it was very easy for us to transition. Yeah, that's huge. Wow. That's, huge. that's, that's really I mean, it's, it's, for, you know, that's, uh, that's one of those things like we were talking about, like that was super fortunate for your business, but, oh, yeah. but you know, yeah. you had a, a decade or decades plus of big business experience that led you to like, even just using the concept of yeah. a strategic plan and you right. happened to pick a good one. Don't get me wrong, but it wasn't so far off the map. You picked it because it was going to help your business, you know, regardless of, of some unpredictable lockdown. So, yeah, no, I think that's that. What a great lesson. Yeah. Always, yeah, I, always be growing. Yeah. So when I saw all the young people migrating to more and more digital sales and I said, no, to stay tuned to the younger people, I have to, have a lot of digital offering and that's why we changed. Yeah, it totally makes sense. And, and, you know, uh, kudos to you for keeping aware of that. And oh, uh, you know, that's, that's terrific. So I, I don't know anything about the restaurant business. You talked a little bit about how you pick a location and different things. And the, the, the uh, are you looking at like demographic information or yeah, we at, yeah, yeah. Right. We look at the demographic information. Yeah. Uh, 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 so, Household income, yeah. uh, traffic generators, actual traffic uh, flow uh, uh, in front of your store, uh, the access to your store. Uh, I only go with end caps so that I, there is visibility. Oh, on top right. of that, now, now, because of the technology, I actually use the pink studies. So when I'm opening a new store, I look at where are the people coming from now? So the, the telephone pings will tell you which way people are coming from, whatever. So that way I know how far they're coming from. So, uh, and I like to open stores without cannibalizing an existing store. That's terrific. Yeah. That's so awesome. the, you're, the, when you say ping studies, you mean studies that actually follow people's cell phones. Yeah, so, so you know where, where they've been. Right. So basically this company, this company, uh, what it does is, okay, they'll say, okay, you, 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 they look at the pings at your store and your shopping yep. center and yep. they look at where did they originate from? Did they come from work? Did they come from school? And what, what do they do after they eat? Where are they going? So they capture that data and give you that data and you pay for that. Of course. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, yeah of course you pay. Prices. No, that's fine. Yes. Yeah. But what a, what a yeah. fascinating, that's yeah. so smart. I mean, we, yeah. you know, we talk about the importance of, of being data driven, but yeah. I, I like, that's a brilliant, I mean, it's a little creepy. Don't get me wrong, but it's a, it's <laughs> that, a brilliant. That is available. It's that's legal. what I'm saying. You, you, yeah, yeah. you, yeah. you yeah. didn't make it creepy. It's just creepy that it exists, but, oh, but if, it, if it's oh. going to exist, you might as well take a look at it. Yeah. That's great. So, I mean, that's how, I mean, that's the same technology they can, they use for crime solving now where the right. phone is. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh, the traffic, everything, how, you know, when, yeah. you, when you oh, yeah. down on the maps. So, the yeah, that's way. true. Yeah. You're really doing forensics, aren't you? On, yeah. on yeah. the location itself. I mean, what you, you don't just know talked about. Customer name yeah. or whatever, but at least you know where the pings are. So no, you, just, yeah, you don't know who these people are, but, yeah. but you're, yeah, you know where they've come from and, and how much they make in a general sense. And yeah, that's fascinating. So, and then you can go to the United States postal service, every, every door direct mail. Yep. And you can basically guess you street by street, home by home, income level. Yeah. So you can get every subdivision what the income level is. Yeah. That's great. Oh, that's yep. terrific. So, uh, okay. So I, I love all this. We're talking about your success and everything, but you know, we're a little different here. We really like mistakes because maybe it's because I've made no, so many. No, we, no, let me tell you, it's, <laughs> it's a struggle. It, it is a struggle. Every yeah. day it's been a challenge to make it profitable. So of course, let me give you an example, okay? So I try to stay ahead. So when we first launched our concept in 2011, I had actually introduced eight vegetarian items way ahead of the vegan and vegetarian trend 11 years ago. 
as vegan became more and more popular, we offered a lot more. I have five tacos. You can't get anywhere else. No beyond the meat or whatever, made with real ingredients, real vegetables on the menu, okay? I did that to kind of offset the prices of the meat and everything else going up. And then comes the pandemic. And right after that, supply chain problems. So right now, we used to pay $15 for a box of eggs. Now the same box went to as high as $72. Last week, it was 66 bucks. Okay? Oh my gosh. Wow. The cheap combination I used to melt to make the queso, I paid 55 bucks for it. Now it's $94. It's across the board. It's oh. went crazy. So, so the show profit right now is virtually impossible unless I cut the portions or lower the quality of the food, right. which I don't want to because I survived 11 years doing the right thing. Why would I kill the concept right now? So right now, yeah, I'm operating my stores, making hardly any profit whatsoever for things to get better. Because if I go change stuff, because I could get a good cook for $13. Now I have to pay $17 for a guy who can't even cook properly. Right. Mm. And then the turnover in the front of the house is extremely high because they come and they jump. These young kids leave from place to place in no time whatsoever. They don't have the same work ethic we grew up with. It's a totally right. different mindset. So with that, to make money now is virtually impossible. So have you I'm, raised your have you had have you raised your prices at all? Can yeah, you do I that? The prices, but yeah. you can't raise it enough. I mean, there's no way I could pass it out to my, my customers. So I have taken a couple of price increases, but that doesn't offset. So you when you were paying two dollars and ninety-nine cents for chicken breast and it goes to as high as five forty-four and it's slowly coming down now. I can't I can't double a taco or double a case yeah. 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 So, so, so you just have to, as a good businessman, you got to come back and say, okay, hopefully, maybe there is something going to change. Hopefully, there's going to be a recession. I mean, you, you, it's, you don't want a uh, recession, but yeah, you I know want, what you mean, though. You yeah. want a recession to kind of, there need, well, there needs to be a correction, is correction. what you're looking there is, for. There needs to be yeah. a correction, right? Yeah. It, right now, it's out of control. We lost. I think what happened. I mean, the labor it's also shifted. Okay, we used to get the immigrant workforce who used to come and work in the kitchen, whatever. And a lot of them went to construction because construction was booming and they could make more money in construction. Okay. Right. The normal American kids, they used to come and work in the restaurants, but are not now with uh, they've gone to work for Target and whatever, where they just walk around on their phone and fill the orders and make 15 bucks an hour and get benefits. So there is yeah. no reason for them to come get abused in the restaurant. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, so the whole thing changed. And then, uh, a lot of people, when they got the $1,400 every month and so on, those guys, the young people kind of moved back with the parents. And they, so, I mean, they all kind of are doing their social media companies and whatever, because I mean, I'm on LinkedIn. So I get at least four people trying to sell me social media every day. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, it is interesting. And, and yeah. I, it, it will be fascinating to see this shift. And I think we will see, uh, maybe we're already starting to see it out here in California. I think we are. Um, in later into this year, as as we get maybe back to a uh, this you know market that yeah uh, different values, I guess. No, there's going to be a correction. I see all the big guys; they stopped building new restaurants. I stopped all my plants. I had three stores I was considering. I stopped it completely. I'm not going to touch anything until the economy changes, where you can actually hire people and the prices come down. There's no point opening one right now. You can't make any money. Yeah, you can't make any money. How about the, the talk about the, the you have bars at your restaurant uh, counter yeah, yeah. alcohol. Yeah. Is, yeah, we is, serve liquid in all our restaurants. Yes, it's significant part of I imagine of profit it, generation it, getting it changed day? after COVID. Ah, so, hmm. so before COVID, seventy percent of the customers ate in the dining room, and thirty percent took it to go. Okay, during the COVID, it was seventy percent to go and thirty percent in the dining room. Now, that whole mindset has not completely changed. Right now. Even though I have a bar and everything, 52% of our customers still take the food to go. Wow. With that said, my liquor sales in my, let's say in my good store, liquor sales used to be about 19% of sales. Now they're 11% of sales. Wow. Yeah. And the drink sales, the soft drink sales and iced tea sales, you know, they're down almost 30%. So when you take the two most profitable 
which actually help you bring the food cost down, whereas everything else, the food and paper costs have been gone up incredibly high along with the natural gas. I used to pay 400 bucks a store for natural gas. Now I pay almost 800 bucks. It's doubled. Yeah, it's brutal. Mm. So it's, it's kind of brutal right now. So yeah. anybody who thinks, oh, I'm going to open a restaurant, I'm going to be rich. No, it's not happening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's just, you've been in, around the restaurant industry for a long time. Are, and I know maybe this one is, you know, a different type of cycle, but these cycles must come and go, right? Over- no, this is worst I've ever seen. I've never yeah, seen- I, I, I would agree with you on that. But yeah. it, when when costs, I mean, th- there must be times when, uh, or maybe there isn't, I don't know, I'm speculating. When, no, we when- never had this kind of inflation. So I mean, all yeah. the big guys I work for, you took two price increases every year. So first half, you took maybe 3%. On half the items, and then late in the December you came back into three percent again. So overall, you you compensate for inflation taking about three yeah. percent for the whole year. Right now, if the price have gone up by fifteen or sixteen percent for me, I can't take fifteen to two percent yeah. one time. Yeah. So that's yeah. been the biggest challenge, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it sounds like a smart move to you know focus on getting in good people and and kind of waiting for things to turn to turn around, but continue protecting your customer base and and your uh, uh, you know the the concept, right? And the and the, the quality. I think that's the, the, yeah. That's that's cool. that's essential. I mean, I have seen a lot of these so-called fast casual restaurants. You know, they came with the promise of great food. Eventually, they came back and lowered the quality, and they're they're being closing stores. You can't. Customer is too smart. I think you have two sets of customers. They're value-driven customers, and they're going to go to places which offer value. And there are people who are willing to pay a little bit more for good food, quality food, and good portions. And those guys are not that many, but they also support your brand. Yeah, that's great. That makes sense. So, okay, so you're involved really hands-on, especially right now with staffing issues. What's the best part of your day uh, running, you know, running your business? No. So I go to the stores and talk to customers. When customers tell me they drove 30 miles to come and eat the food at my restaurant, wow. that, makes me, that makes me smile. Okay. Yes. Yes. So Boy, that's, that's uh, fantastic. Yeah. Congratulations. Yes. That's good. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, so I have vegan customers who drive from 30, 40 miles to come eat the food because it's pure food. So we basically, I mean, if you go back and say what our whole uh, approach is, you know, we serve, Food made from scratch with pure ingredients, boldly paired to create complex and inventive flavors. That's what we're all about. Yeah. And, cool. and we can't deviate from that. Yeah. So right now things are kind of on hold. You're focused on protecting the brand and the concept. But after things come back, which I know they will, uh, we're very optimistic on this show. Um, you have to be <laughs> to be in business you have for to be, yourself. I'm, I'm yeah. very optimistic. Otherwise, why would I do it? I mean, yes. I could, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Uh, other than farmers, who I think farmers are crazy optimists, <laughs> they have to be too. Business owners are are right up there. But once things turn around, you, it sounds like you want to continue to expand and and grow your footprint and add more restaurants over time. Yes, unquestionably. Awesome. Yes, That's yeah, I mean, so, yeah. So I I guess I, I I look at it like this: I work for large chains and sold for years food, which is not necessarily good for them, good yeah. for them. Now I have to pay back my dues to by going to neighborhoods and making great food to make them healthy and happy. I love that. That's a great outlook. So, Manny, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story. It's it's inspiring, and I've learned a lot. If, if I've one more question before we wrap things up, so uh, and we've given a lot of advice to people. Um, what would you give a, a young person, a new entrepreneur? interested in getting into the food business. I, I have a sense I might know what you say right now based on the timing, but what what piece of advice would you give somebody that's interested in starting a, a business now, like yours? I would say success doesn't come very easily. You're, you, first, you should really make sure that you have a defendable concept. Otherwise, 10 people will copy you in no time. If you know, The second, you have to know how to survive and during the toughest times and realize that a great concept is not built in one year, two years. When I go back and look at some of this, some of these local restaurant chains which succeeded, they've been around for 20, 30 years. And those guys lived in one bedroom apartment for years and didn't drive fancy cars, whatever, till they, and now they're driving, they're living their life. 
but they're paying their dues for a long time. Yeah. I love that. I think it's great. You got to put in the, put in the effort. Um, that's terrific. You know, we'll, we'll put links in our, our show notes on the website to your locations. Um, and, okay. uh, again, thanks again, Monty. It, it's inspiring. And, uh, it, I think it's really important for other entrepreneurs to hear that, Oh, I'm not the only one struggling. And, you know, we try to bring that to, to the show, uh, each day. And, um, it, again, appreciate your time today to learn about Taco okay. Ocho. Awesome. Just, just tell them with my experience, with running so many stores, I'm struggling. So that means if some guy who did not have the same experience, he's struggling, he should not feel bad. This is yeah. the time. It's kind of a tough time right now. Yeah. No, that's great advice. Thank you again. We really appreciate it. Hey, thank you guys. Thanks for doing this. You have a wonderful evening. You too. Bye-bye. Great stuff, man. I, I you yeah. know, I, I, I miss these, this part of these interviews. I may, and maybe that's me being selfish, Shannon. No, I, no. It, you know, I, <laughs> I agree. I, I love hearing ideas from from other people like i mean that's really what it is his um that whole thing where he said you got to go get yourself 20 to 30 30 thousand customers for that type of business to to do a million dollars a year you know in sales it's like wow that's a lot of customers yeah and he and using location forensics oh uh as you mentioned that's a that's a great term where they're doing ping he's buying the data from location information to see where the customers are coming from, where they go after. I mean, uh, it is, it, it's amazing. Makes um, me feel, and he also made me feel less bad about running with uh, much thinner margins than I would like to. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. It's, uh, well, and com- commend, I, I really value the authenticity of explaining what a struggle it is in the restaurant yeah. business right now. And it's probably that way in many service industries and yeah. folks often don't like to talk about it, but you know, he's, he's just a great guy. One of the things I, I really enjoyed hearing him talk about was getting the best part of his day was getting closer to the customer versus working for a big corporation. Uh, and, and that's what seems to really drive him that, that engagement that he gets. And I love that because that, that is often the best part about it when, you know, most people are, most people are pretty cool. And if you offer a great service, they want to tell you about it. And, yep. uh, I, I really appreciated having uh, Monty on the show today and learning about Taco Ocho. Yeah. Great stuff. Thanks for coming on, Monty. Thanks for listening, everybody. Again, feedback at businessbrain.show. If you have thoughts about this. If you think we should have done this as two episodes and chopped it up, let us know that too. We really do want to do it. Until next week, keep living that charmed life.